to Clara. Hello and welcome to round one here at Grand Prix Santa Clara. Maria Bartholdi in the booth, joined by expert Jacob Van Lunen and Rich Hagen along for the ride as well. And there you see them, the Peach Garden Oath, and that is where we are kicking things off for this tournament. I'm excited to see what they're playing, JVL. Do you have any idea? Um, these three players all like to play really good decks. Reed sometimes ventures into the realm of you know, personal exploration with his deck choices, but the other two are really devoted to playing the best deck in the format. So let's just clarify where everyone's sitting. On the far end, Owen Turtenwald is playing standard. They're going to be over there. We're going to start on the middle table. That's where modern is. Think of small, medium, large. Standard in seat A, modern in seat B, legacy in seat C. So Jensen on legacy, Duke is modern, Owen Turtenwald in standard. Maria, away we go. All right, here we go. We're kicking things off with some fetch lands. And it was really interesting to me too, JVL, which player chose which deck for this week and like who was going to have to play Legacy. And that kind of decision was important for these team members. Absolutely. And I think that it, it's interesting that William Jensen is playing Legacy because as we know, he's been playing this game for a really long time. There are a few cards that are going to surprise him. All right, Inquisition of Kozilek is going to kick things off. <laughs> I told JBL before we started that I wanted to keep track of how many Thoughtseize and Inquisitions we were going to see this weekend. I'm going to keep a ticker here. You can guess in chat how many you think we're going to see. I've got it at one. And he's going to take a look at uh, Gomez's hand here. What do you see, JBL? So it looks like Gomez is playing a Titan Shift deck. Now, what this deck is trying to do is it's trying to get lands in play, particularly mountains, alongside Valakut the Molten Pinnacle. Now, if you have enough mountains in play, Valcut the Molten Pinnacle starts dealing damage to creatures and or players. So if you have seven lands in play and you cast Scape Shift and search your library for a Valcut and six mountains, you get to do 18 damage to your opponent. If you have eight lands in play and you do the same thing, you're able to do 36 and so on and so forth. So a really powerful strategy, oftentimes a turn four combo deck that's also able to kill the opponent's creatures, really strong. Reed Duke is going to be attempting to disrupt Andres Gomez's game plan before you know, the big scape shift happens. So tell me a little bit about why cards like Thoughtseize and Inquisition are so important in modern. So we're, we're going to see it a lot in this matchup right here, where you know Gomez's deck is very, very strongly relying on scape shift and Primeval Titan in particular. Those two cards are the, really the only two cards that matter. Uh, the rest of it, you know, those cards interact a little bit, but Primeval Titan and Scape Shift, those cards win the game. So if Reed Duke is able to use cards like Inquisition of Kozilek and Thoughtseize to disrupt Gomez's game plan, particularly Thoughtseize, which can deal with the two cards that matter, that's going to give him a window wherein he's able to win the game before the combo happens. And if you had to put Reed Duke on a deck here, uh, what would you put him on? Well, seeing that deck, I would say, or seeing the Godless Shrine there, I would say it's probably Eldrazi and Taxes. Uh, what that deck is trying to do is it's attempting to use uh, lands that produce multiple, man like multiple mana to cast cards like Thought Not Seer to disrupt the opponent. And then it also uses discard spells to disrupt the opponent. And then it plays white creatures that are kind of hate creatures to mess with the opponent's game plan. Quick terminology question. I've got Wooded Foothills up on the screen there. When you say a fetch land, what's that about? So that means it's a land that you can sacrifice to search your library for a particular basic land type and then put that card into play. What's really interesting about fetch lands in a format like Modern is that they can get the dual lands that uh, were printed in both Ravnica blocks. Incidentally, just uh, hearing from our spies down on the floor, Reed Duke may be on some kind of four color death shadow, uh, apparently, so maybe not. Maybe we'll see death and taxes later because they are, of course, inevitable, as we know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Inquisition number two here from Reed Duke. Chalk it up. I've got two on my scoreboard so far. <laughs> Taking a look at Gomez's hand again. And like you said, a, a deck like t uh, Scape Shift relies so heavily on having the critical parts that it needs to uh, kind of get its engine going that this card has got to be brutal for it. Absolutely. So here, if Reed does decide to take the Secure Tribe Elder, then Gomez you know, only has access to four mana which means his Summoner's Pack to go get a Primeval Titan becomes significantly worse. The Scape Shift doesn't really do anything. Uh, now Gomez is really relying on drawing cards that get lands out of his deck just right off the top. 
And there you see a Sakura Tribe Elder on your screen, uh, which seems like kind of a card that doesn't do a heck of a lot, but when you're in a deck like Scape Shift, it's just vital. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just incredible because cards like Rampant Growth have historically been very powerful. The nice part about Sakura Tribe Elder is that not only is it a Rampant Growth, but you can also use cards that return creatures from your graveyard to your hand to get it back, or you can block with it and then sacrifice it and search your library for a land. So it saves you a few damage while also ramping your mana. And you mentioned about you know the critical number of damage kind of being 18 for Scape Shift. And you can already see Reed Duke is down to 14 life, which is why you don't even have to do 20 in a format like Modern. Absolutely. And that's a big part about Modern is that you know, a deck like Scape Shift is a turn 4 combo deck as opposed to a turn 5 combo deck because everybody is dealing themselves damage with their lands. All right, Reed Duke de dealing more damage to himself there with the cycled Street Wraith. Pay two life, draw a card. Now, why would he want to do damage to himself, JVL? <laughs> <laughs> so, Reed Duke's deck is playing a card called Death Shadow. And this is just, it only costs one black mana, but it's a 13-13. Now, the drawback is that it gets minus one, minus one for every point of life you have. So if you have 10 life, it's a 3-3 three, three for one black mana. If you have one life, it's a 12-12 for one black mana. That's a pretty good rate there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's our third Thoughtseize or Inquisition, by the way. Just pointing that out. Sakura Tribe Elder there for Gomez. <laughs> Just out of interest, how far can you count? Because you're at three Inquisitions already. Yes. I'm, I'm, a, bit, I'm a bit concerned how, you know, like the middle <laughs> rounds of tomorrow may go. So you're like 43... I, you know, I'll see. I'm kind of using a tally system to maybe make it easier on myself. Okay, we'll fair. We'll see how it goes. And I wanted to bring up something that you mentioned, JVL, when you said a turn four combo deck versus a turn three combo deck. What exactly does that mean in this kind of format? So modern is a format where most combo decks are not going to be killing you until the fourth turn. And some combo decks are a little bit slower but have more interaction. So... Uh, what I meant by that is that the deck is capable of killing you on the fourth turn as opposed to capable of killing somebody on the third turn. Fairly consistently, would you say? Um, I would say the m most average draw for a Titan Shift deck is probably around turn five. All right, a Grim Flayer in play for Reed Duke now. Talk to me a little bit about um, Grim Flayer's role in a, a four-color Death Shadow deck for Reed Duke. So this card is going to fill Reed Duke's graveyard with cards like Lingering Souls. It's also very large, very fast, thanks to cards like Thoughtseize and Inquisition of Kozilek and Street Wraith and Mishra's Bauble. So essentially, a lot of the time it's a 4-4 four, four for 2 mana, just on the surface. Then it also has Trample, which makes it very good against a card like Sakura Tribe Elder. And then it also fills the graveyard with cards that do things when they're in the graveyard or makes your Tarmogoyf much larger. Yeah, I'm looking here at Reed Duke's deck list. Four copies of Tarmogoyf. Huh. Oh, yeah. Not so usually a, a card creature. we see with Death Shadow. So if you are just joining us, welcome along. And the first game result is in. It comes from Standard. That's table A. Owen Turtonwild leads Nathan Wendell by 1 to 0. A, B, and C, top to bottom, Standard, Modern, Legacy. That's the way it's going to work. Small, medium, and large. Standard at the top. Modern in the middle, which is where we are, with Reed Duke against Sandris Gomez and William Jensen against Paul Gomez is in the Legacy format. Commentators in the booth, me, your host Rich Hagen, Maria Bartholdi on play-by-play, -play, and our resident expert Pro Tour champion for 2007, Mr. Jacob Van Luna. Maria, back to you. Thank you so much, Rich. An interesting game we've got going here between Reed Duke and Andres Gomez. Four color, Death Shadow. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, Grixis Death Shadow was kind of the deck going in, uh, you know, Vegas last summer. Why four color? So Four Color Death Shadow is much more similar to the versions of the Death Shadow deck that did really well at a Grand Prix about a year ago now, where uh, I believe Josh Utter Layton won the Grand Prix. The top eight also featured players like Jerry Thompson playing a similar deck, and that was more of a Jun Death Shadow kind of deck. Now, what Reed's deck looks like to me is a version of that deck that's also splashing for Lingering Souls. And Lingering Souls is an exceptionally powerful card that's very good in a lot of matchups in Modern right now. And the extra color in the Death Shadow deck kind of helps you in some ways because you just play more lands that deal you damage and you want to deal yourself damage to make those Death Shadows really big and really scary. All right, here we see a huge swing from Grim Flayer backed up with a Teamer Battle Rage from Red Duke. Now, this is interesting because Teamer Battle Rage, uh, you know, usually this is a card you use to kill your opponent. Yeah. But 
Reed Duke, right now, he only had three different card types in his graveyard. So by using that Teamer Battle Rage, he's not only just giving a 2-2 two -two Grim Flayer double strike, but he's also turning that Grim Flayer into a 4-4 Trample. I was going to say, I don't think that's enough to kill Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> Normally you see it as a finisher. That's a really interesting play. Good point. So uh, Reed Duke with all the card types he needs in his graveyard currently. There we see a Terminate on top. Yeah, there's a, there's a newer version of Terminate for you. Um, one, <laughs> of the, one of the fun things about Modern Legacy is that players who have the deck for years are often playing with original cards uh, so that you know, your first edition terminates, as it were. Plane Shift was a very fun set. It was. <laughs> Here you go. There's the, uh, the Plane Shift Ooh, version that's nice. in Reed Duke's graveyard. But we're, we're a, little, a little more modern, one might say. <laughs> There you saw a Mishra's Bobble uh, from Reed Duke. And this is a card you'll see pop up in Modern from time to time. Tell me why he would play something like this. So Mishra's Bobble is interesting because it's what players often call a slow trip. So what that <laughs> means is that it's, it replaces itself, but it doesn't do so until the next turn. Now this can seem like a pretty big drawback, but with a card like Mishra's Bobble, you use it with Fetchlands, which we talked about earlier, to look at the top card of your deck. And if you want that card to stay there, you don't sacrifice your fetch land. And if you don't want that card, you can sacrifice your fetch land and then kind of control your draws. The thing that's really powerful about a card like Mishra's Bauble is that it also makes your Tarmogoyfs much larger and just decreases your overall deck size so that it becomes a more consistent machine as it plays through a game of Magic. So Slow Trip is kind of the, the secondary, sort of the next level to the idea of Can Trip, which is just draw a card, yes. um, so it replaces itself. <laughs> And if you're wondering why a cantrip is called a cantrip, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm lost. I don't know. <laughs> By the way, Sakura Tribelder last turn, getting in there for one <laughs> from Gomez. Gl Grim Flayer swinging for the fences here again for Duke. Now things are starting to get dangerous for Reed Duke. I mean, there are five lands on the other side of the battlefield. There's a Sakura Tribelder in play. Uh, another land could be lethal. All right, Reed Duke is going to slam that Death Shadow, and there we get a couple of spirits from Lingering Souls. But you've always kind of got to be on your toes against a deck like Scapeshift. And you just mentioned the addition of White in Reed's deck to accommodate this Lingering Souls, and here you kind of see the payoff. You'll be able to flash back if you For want. For the first time in 2018, we get to say, God bless the chat room. Cantrip comes from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Cantrip, uh, many people are saying, um, is that um, it's a small spell that you cast. It's a zero-level spell that you cast in D&D. So it's basically a, a free spell, apparently. Ah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So we were able to bring that information to you because, of course, it's on brand because it's a Wizards <laughs> of the Coast product. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all right. <laughs> all right, Gomez here tapping two. His hand's been torn quite apart by Reed Duke over the course of this game with no less than three Inquisitions and Thought Seizes. So this is a really important turn, um, because if Gomez is able to find his seventh land and cast Escape Shift, he's going to win the game here. If he's unable to find the seventh land or a card that gets the seventh land, then there are he will seven. not. There's seven. Escape Shift. And here's the thing. Duke did not take the Escape Shift out of Gomez's hand. Yeah, and he, the only discards, but I guess he had drawn a Thought Seize yep. at one point. But uh, at that point, Gomez really needed to draw, have three draw steps in a row that, that gave him a land in order to win the game. All right, so he is going to make him do it. And there is v Valakid the Molten Pinnacle, the card that does it all. Yeah, now six mountains coming into play this at the same time as this Valka at the Molten Pinnacle. They all see each other here. So each of those six mountains is going to be able to do three damage to target creature or player. Reed Duke's life total is only eight. Yep. Plenty of damage. And that'll do it. Gomez here picking up game one against Reed Duke. An update also from Legacy there, uh, Rich. Yeah, William Jensen's 1-0 up on Paul Gomez, and we have uh, all three matchups now. Teema Energy for Owen Turtonwald is up against White Blue Cycling for Nathan Wendell. Uh, Duke on four-color Death Shadow, as we know, against Titan Shift for Andres Gomez. And then John Gomez 
um, or Paul Gomez, I'm imagining, um, brothers, Grixis Delver against William Jensen on Sneak and Show. So we are going to table C, and this is... <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Look at this. <laughs> Where should we start putting cards up on here? How about... Uh, mm. We've got a show and tell there, a lovely, lovely Emrakul, a blood moon, a ponder, a lightning bolt. <laughs> Take a look, Paul Gomez. <laughs> Take a look with that Gitaxian probe. Read them and weep. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's show and tell, which is um, the, the signature card. That's that's where bad things happen to opponents in general. And yeah, show and tell is really powerful. I mean, one, you can just put an Eldrazi into play, and your opponent likely isn't going to put anything into play that can match up against it. But what's even more powerful uh, about a deck like Jensen's is that he could put a card like Omniscience into play. Uh, and then he could just cast the the Emrakul and take an extra turn and win the game right on the spot. Um, now, the uh, the sneak and show deck it can also just start putting in cards like Grizzlebrand, and then you can draw seven cards and draw into more combo pieces. So a really powerful strategy here. Uh, one of the decks that I think a lot of people were looking to play with this weekend. Absolutely. It's kind of like a legacy staple, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. As far as power level goes, I think this is maybe the best deck in legacy right now. Uh, the one major drawback for it is that its matchup against the Delver strategies isn't quite the best. It's not, it's not just unwinnable. It's still reasonable, but it is definitely lower than 50% if both players were at the same skill level. <laughs> and Paul is on, is on a Delver strategy, I believe. Volcanic Island in play there uh, for Gomez. Speaking of good mana that we talked about uh, earlier in Modern, I just recently took my first kind of steps into Legacy and was just absolutely shocked at what kind of lands I could play. Yeah, well, you're not getting shocked as you would be yes, in Modern. Indeed. Yeah, <laughs> <if> <laughs> you absolutely will, you know, shocked as well. I'm glad you went there. <laughs> I knew it as I said it. And I was like, oh boy, I'm setting somebody up here. It's almost like we rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. Oh, and game and match on the top there. Standard is done. Owen Turtenwald wins 2-0 to zero over Nathan Wendell. And what that means, a reminder that two players out of three winning their matches equals match over. There's no 3-0 uh, in this one. So if William Jensen wins this game, that will be game set and match to the Peach Garden Oath, regardless of Redupe going down in game number one as we see Blood Moon. All right, so a Lotus Petal there for, uh, for Jensen, casting a Blood Moon. It's going to get Force of Will here, exiling a Ponder for Paul Gomez. And uh, Force of Will, t talk to me a little bit about this card, JVL, because it's so important in this format. Why? So Force of Will, in many ways, is the glue that holds Legacy together. There are so many powerful combo strategies that there needs to be some sort of hard counterspell that you can cast without paying any mana. Now, it's a big drawback. You're paying one life, which doesn't matter that much, but the fact that you have to exile a blue card from your hand, that's a big deal. You're spending two cards to deal with one of your opponent's cards, oftentimes a card that doesn't cost that much mana. The thing is, is sometimes your opponent plays a card that essentially wins the game by itself. And for those situations, you need a card like Force of Will because it's going to get you out of that bind in a pinch. All right, there we see a Pithing Needle for Gomez. What do you think he's targeting there for Jensen? Um, I imagine he's going to name Sneak Attack. Now, Sneak Attack is a powerful enchantment that costs four mana, and you can pay a single red and put a creature from your hand directly onto the battlefield. It can attack that turn, but then you have to sacrifice it. But usually one turn's enough when the card you're putting into play is uh, Emrakul the Eon's Torn mm. and or uh, Grizzlebrand. So hearing from down on the floor, um, th that looks like T-A-R-N on there. Scalding Tarn is what, uh, what they've, they've announced. Oh, wow. And see, this is a great play from Paul Gomez. See, he used Jataxian Probe and recognized that William Jensen had Scalding Tarn in hand. And he's going to use that to prevent Jensen from being able to sacrifice those fetch lands and advance his mana here in the game. The really powerful play, essentially a preemptive Stone Rain against Jensen, who only has one land left in his hand. And Legacy is a format where you can attack other players' lands pretty freely. Yeah, uh, cards like Wasteland make land destruction a very real part of the legacy format. 
An interesting note here about Jensen's deck, however, is because he's playing a Blood Moon deck, he can turn the Scalding Tarn in his hand that no longer has an activated ability into a mountain if he is at some point able to stick one of those Blood Moons. All right, that Delver of Secrets has been transformed for Gomez. So he's already got a clock there on the battlefield. And uh, Jensen just sitting back there on one land. His hand was absolutely stacked, but... I mean, when we arrived, I thought, oh, okay, time for the time warp match then, because yeah. it, it looked like Jensen had everything he could possibly want, and, and it was, I'm just going to show you, this is my hand that's going to destroy you in a minute, and that's not where we are at all. See, and what we're seeing now is one of the reasons why the Delver decks are well positioned against these combo strategies. They play a threat that closes the game very fast in the form of Delver of Secrets, and it only costs one mana, so they're not committing much in the form of resources to it, and then they can counter spells and make their opponent discard cards pretty freely. And as we saw, that uh, Delver revealed a daze on the top of Gomez's library too, uh, which has the ability to keep Jensen at bay even further. A oh, Cabal Therapy here. This is one of my favorite cards ever printed. Ooh, tell us more, JVL. Yeah, now Cabal Therapy is a card where you cast it, then when it resolves, you name a card, and your opponent has to discard all copies of that card. Now, an important thing about Cabal Therapy is if your opponent ever plays this card against you, do not ask them what card they are naming unless you intend on the Cabal Therapy resolving, because by asking them, you are insinuating that you are allowing it to resolve. And uh, it's an important note for newer players. So, so you're mo <laughs> moving things along. You're saying, Correct. yeah, sure, okay, what do you, what, it's sure what card is, yes. is essentially what you're deemed to have said. Exactly. Okay. Whereas if you want to counter it, you need to counter it before you ask that question. <laughs> and that ripped the show and tell right out of Jensen's hand. Plenty of suggestions in chat, by the way, that may maybe we should, just to make sure that Team Energy loses, we should have the standard deck play against the modern deck. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see Teamer Energy versus something, some nonsense in modern. Lantern Control. <laughs> oh. Oh, Rogue Refiner, huh? Interesting. Actually, I, I don't know how bad its matchup would be against Lantern Control <laughs> oh if, they, if they play like four a braid, right? And not that they would, but... <laughs> Uh, the bridge is all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be cool. Now I want to see it. <laughs> all right, there we had a lightning bolt from Jensen taking down that Delver of Secrets. So the threat from Gomez dealt with for the moment, buying Jensen some much needed time to be able to put something together here as a, one of his win conditions show until now in the graveyard. Ponder from Gomez. One of uh, many one single blue mana spells that you'll see across Modern and Legacy. And the nice part about Modern is because you get to play with cards like Ponder and Brainstorm, uh, your deck feels a lot smaller than it might otherwise. If you're only playing four copies of a card, it becomes very unlikely that you won't see a copy over the course of a game, even if the game is only five turns long. Okay, first trivia of the day for people in chat. If you type in Ponder to Gatherer, three different cards come up. One of them is, of course, Ponder. What are the other two? Ooh, great mm. question. Misty here for Gomez. Here's the first one. Ah! Uh, <laughs> aerial Responder, I love it. And any takers for the other one? Ooh, okay. Majoring Responder. Should have known that one. There you go. <laughs> Just something for you to um, think about. All right, so was uh, Gomez able to counter Jensen's Ponder there? Yeah, see, he used a card called Pyroblast, and this is a really powerful spell. It only costs one red mana, and it counters a blue spell or destroys a blue permanent. So a red counter spell. Yes. I love it. Now, something that's interesting that's happening to Jensen here is that he is essentially on one less land than he has in play for all intents and purposes on any particular turn. The reason that is is because Gomez has a daze in hand that Jensen knows about. Now, Jensen doesn't want to play a spell directly into the daze because Paul Gomez, his entire deck, is castable with that amount of mana he has in play. It's essentially just a free counterspell. So... Jensen needs to wait until he has, you know, 
a f access to a fourth mana before he plays a three mana spell, or access to a fifth mana before he wants to play a four mana spell, and so on and so forth. I gotta say, one of the uh, incredible things for me playing Legacy for the first time was being able to counter somebody's spells with no mana, essentially. Mm -hmm. Days, of course, does require an island to be in play, but that's it. Yeah, and it's such a, you know, a small thing that you have to be able to do, and for these decks that play cards like Days, their whole deck costs one or two mana. It's not a huge drawback for them to have to return a land back to their hand. And it is essentially, you know, a free counterspell. All right, Deathrite Shaman hits the table for uh, Gomez here. Another legacy format staple. And why is that, JVO? So Deathrite Shaman is a Swiss army knife in a format like Legacy. Many opponents are trying to, you know, interact with graveyards on one end or the other. The fact that you can exile lands or instants or creatures. It gives you a lot of play against many decks and what their game plan is. It's also just a bird of paradise in a format like Legacy where so many people are playing so many fetch lands. And as a result, it's just incredibly powerful. Well, one's going to hit the bin there for Gomez and down comes another one. Back over to Jensen. Yeah, worth mentioning that Deathrite Shaman, a staple in Legacy. I wonder why they banned it in modern. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good grief was not particularly fair in that format. Not especially, no. <laughs> Doesn't feel very fair in Legacy either, to be honest. <laughs> there are a lot but of things You know what? Don't. Nothing <laughs> feels fair in Legacy. That's kind of the point, I think. That's why we love it. All right, Young Pyromancer here uh, for Gomez. And this, of course, kind of a powerhouse card. It's going to get uh, Force of Willed from Jensen. Gurmog Angler is the follow-up play here. Angler, of course, we'll see in uh, Death Shadow decks in Modern. And here it is, popping up in Legacy. Just a big 5-5. Five five. Yeah, 5-5s five for one mana, are, turns out, are quite good. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Death Shadow. You're not always a 5-5. Five five. <laughs> right away, anyway. I was going to say, you'd feel pretty despondent if your Death Shadow wasn't a 5-5 five five when it yeah. was doing its thing. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right now a Death Shadow fits in that gaping more of the Gomag Angler, yeah. but now. <laughs> Those lifeless eyes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I never noticed that before. It's really creepy, I'm actually. I'm tired. It was jet lag. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, the cards. Sorry. <laughs> How does Jensen have to be... I mean, it, is his deck able to deal with something like this? If, I mean, obviously, if he's able to stick a sneak and show or something like that. But... Uh, yeah, so at this excuse, point... Excuse me, show and tell. I think, you know, Jensen's path to victory at this point has become attacking with Emrakul the Aaron's Torn. And... All right, there is a show and tell. Looks like it may happen. All right, kids to the front of the class. Oh, days. He can just pay it. There's Emrakul. Shaman's going to exile a card from Jensen's graveyard, and there's a look at the 15-15. The big Eldrazi herself, Emra Cool, the Eons Torn. Just looking adorable. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the Australian Open Tennis in a couple of weeks. That'll have a lot of 15-15 in it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Great tennis joke, Rich. That was a good tennis joke. I liked it. I just watched Battle of the Sexes on the plane on the way over here. Is it good? Yeah. <laughs> who, won who wins that? I still don't know who wins. I do know who wins here. It is William Jensen with Emrakul, the Eons Torn. And that means that that first game we saw of Andres Gomez against Reed Duke did not matter to the overall result. It is 2-0 to Owen Turtonwild, 2-0 to William Jensen. Uh, the middle table might play out some more, but we will not uh, stay put. That is the end of our main match here in round number one. Um, but uh, that is uh, the state of play. On the back table, uh, you can see um, that uh, you can see that the back table uh, is going still, uh, and we are going to, after a <coughs> short break, take you right the way back um, to the start uh, of that back table match. So you'll get to see um, Josh Utter Layton. You'll get to see David Ochoa and Jerry Thompson. Uh, on the back table. So, Jake, while we, uh, while we get that all queued up um, and, and get ready for our first break of the day, um, what, was your, what was your takeaway from round number one on our front table? Well, we watched the best team in the world 
play against another team. Uh, they put up a good fight. You know, it really looked like Gomez was going to win that second game there against Jensen. Uh, but Jensen found a way to play around all of the cards in Gomez's hand, really used all of his cards to their maximum value potential, 